The lectionary this morning offers us these verses from the third chapter of Jonah as our Hebrew scripture for this morning. So here now, our reading from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. Listen to God's word. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on a sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil, ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them, and God did not do it. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are with us always. Yet even though we know this truth, your grace continues to astound us. Draw near to us now as we reflect on your word, opening our minds, our eyes, our spirits, and our hearts to you. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on, on all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our lectionary for this morning makes it seem so easy, doesn't it? I find it odd that the lectionary has chosen only these six verses from this small book named for the prophet Jonah. And let's face it, those of us who have heard this story before, we know that what we heard is really not the best part. It is not the part with a ship and a storm and Jonah being thrown overboard. And it's not the story where there's a gourd vine that grows and is torn down and grows again. And it is not the part with the whale. And if you don't know these parts, go back and read it. It's only four chapters long. You could read it in probably about 20 minutes at most. But rather today, our lectionary gives us six verses about a prophet who does his job and does it well. We hear that Jonah travels throughout the great city of Nineveh for, for days, but even only one day into his three-day journey, has convinced an entire people to repent, to turn from their sin, to turn to God, and all of the people, great and small, repent, wear their sackcloth, and God changes God's mind. We hear this story of a successful prophet who goes and convinces not only a bunch of individuals to confess the ways that they have hurt one another, but to convince an entire culture to repent of their collective sin, the systemic sin that has formed their people, that informs who they are and how they live together and after just a day of Jonah's preaching, everybody has repented. And God changes God's mind. Judgment is deferred, and the Ninevites live faithfully ever after, at least for a while, and not a long one. 
Jonah succeeds and he sets this high bar for prophets everywhere for even just a little while. And we could imagine his TED talk where he would talk about how it is possible for people to listen. It is possible for not only individuals but systems to change. It is possible even to change the mind of God. The lectionary for today makes it seem so easy, doesn't it? But it has those two words you might miss if you're not paying attention that reminds us that it's the second time that God called out to, to Jonah and that it took at least one other occasion to get Jonah to make that journey into Nineveh and to proclaim the word that God had appointed to his lips. But our lectionary makes it all seem so easy. Now, as easy as it sounds in those few verses, our Hebrew scripture reminds us that God's hope for the world often interrupts the plans that we have made for ourselves. God's hope for the world disrupts the assumptions we have already made about already else because whether we notice it or not, it is not as simple as the six verses our lectionary offers to us suggests. The story of the entire book of Jonah, and I might submit the entire book of the entire books of Scripture, remind us of a God whose grace is not only for us, but for those that we can't stand, for those who have harmed us and our neighbor, for those who annoy us and irritate us, for those we wished we never met, for those whose way of being in the world has caused us and those we love harm, and that this same grace God gives to all of those people is the very same grace God gives to us. Our text makes it sound so easy. Even when we run from God and God's simple requests of us, Jonah reminds us that God's grace is stronger than storms that swell around us and stronger than the forces of the world that swallow us whole. God's grace is stronger than our objections and tantrums and every refrain of it's not fair, whether they are uttered from the mouth of a prophet Jonah as he tries to run from his call the first time God cries out, or whether we're the ones saying that phrase. God's grace simply will not sit well with everyone. Whether it is us or our enemy who's on the receiving end, the comical prose of Jonah's story reminds us again and again that God's grace is surprising, accessible, persistent, and in fact stronger than all of the forces that say it shouldn't be so. God does things that God does not have to do. God even repairs what God did not break. So although we have only read six verses this morning, I commend to you the entire book of Jonah for your reading. The story of a prophet sent to proclaim God's judgment on Nineveh, a prophet who knows that God is going to be gracious and so God runs because he surely does not want to be the mouthpiece of God's compassion and mercy or grace. The story tells us of a prophet who not only runs away from God but gets swallowed up in the belly of the whale until he agrees to go and do what God has asked of him, kicking and screaming and stomping the whole time. But I love this story of Jonah 
Now, I love this in part because Jonah's absurdity helps me feel a little bit better about myself. There are times when I, too, am tangled up in a tantrum of my own making or scowling because someone took my parking spot at Giant Eagle or because the view from my high horse has made it clear to me that everybody I can see from there needs to change, everybody that is except me, myself, and I. So Jonah smooths out my ruffled feathers. Jonah reminds me that God will work through me and in spite of me, and that the righteous slide into the belly of a whale is a slippery or slope that I might think or might want for myself. But this is what I really love about Jonah's story. I love the God I get to see through Jonah's eyes. I see a God who is audacious and absurd. A God who is more merciful than one might imagine and who extends grace that is frankly inappropriate for how we might treat one another. In this short story, it is abundantly clear that God is a God of grace, a grace so vast and wide and strong that God has a hope in the humanity God has made, and that God simply refuses to give up on any of us. Now make no mistake, God is quick to point out what it is that people do wrong. God shows the Ninevites and the prophet alike where they have failed in their actions and attitudes. But God is the one who initiates reconciliation. God does what God does, searching out the lost and welcoming the outcast into God's own embrace. And God goes on to feed hungry bellies and spirits at table, whether They are those on the guest list or not. Through Jonah's eyes, we see a God who, as Richard Rohr puts it, says, in plain language, God shows out us that love wins out over guilt any day. Rohr goes on to write, it is said that we settle for the short run effectiveness of shaming people instead of the long-term life benefits of true transformation. But then we are a culture of product and efficiency, not terribly patient with growth. God God clearly is much more patient and finally much more effective. God lets Jonah run in the wrong direction but finds a long, suffering, circuitous path to get him back where he needs to be in spite of himself. So it is with us. As we begin this calendar year and we are focusing on the theme of back to the beginnings, it's fitting that we would, as a reformed people of faith, reflect on our beginnings as a people of grace. Grace is a word that is high on our vocabulary list, a word that reminds us of our favor with God, although there is nothing that we could or have or will do to earn it. Now, although I have felt led to preach about grace today, I quickly learned that there are more than I don't know, eight dozen sermons that could be preached from this pulpit this morning, and I will spare you all of them except one today. I was reminded of the theology at the heart of our faith that reminds us of the term of justification by grace through faith and our our need as a people of faith to flesh out what that means for us as, as individuals and for us as God's people. I was reminded that grace is costly. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us that grace is not, a, grace is not grace if it comes cheap. Bonhoeffer reminds us that grace invites us into discipleship, 
nurtures within us discipline and community, and inspires us to confess our sins, holding always before us the cross of Jesus Christ in our life together. And there is yet another sermon to be preached and another Bible study to be had where we might examine what grace would look like when we would make personal and collective choices about how we might spend our time, our money, how we might form our community together. But because this is a series about beginnings, I want to begin our conversation of grace today with a story and an invitation. I guess, and a promise that the conversation will continue. So first, a story. I share this story with the permission of my son, although neither he nor I can remember nor agree um, whether he was three, four, or five years old, but he was one of those ages. It was a warm day and he was playing out in the mud in the front yard, making potions and stews and a really yummy soup in the dirt of the planters outside. It was one of those days where we said it was okay to be covered from head to toe in mud, but he needed to know that the first thing that would happen upon our re-entry to the home was a swift journey to the bathroom for a head to toe shower. He agreed but he he wanted nothing to do with it when the time had come. So as most preschool age kids would do, he yelled, he objected, he tried to run away. And I strategized, I tried to make a game where we would see if we could get through the shower before we could be done finishing together his favorite song. I tried reasoning with him, you know, because that's always goes well when you reason with someone in that age group. But I tried to say, you know, it is okay to play with dirt and we need to take care of our bodies when we are done. And we can't get dirt all through our house and all over our toys and all over your bed at bedtime. So it is just the reasonable choice. And then my voice grew stern when I reminded him that although we know and are teaching him that he is in control of the choices for his own body, his dad and I have the opportunity to override those choices when they are in the interest of his own health or safety, and that we were now in that territory. I cajoled him. I offered him 15 minutes of screen time, PBS Kids, when we were done or a small treat, and it worked well enough to get him into the shower. But when the water hit his body, he was, and this is his word, upset. I tried all the tricks. He needed to be clean. We needed to get on with our day. And so instead of yelling downstairs and asking my husband to tag in. I just softened my voice and I looked into his dark brown eyes and I said, I love you. And he scowled and I said, I love you. And he yelled and I said, I love you. And I put soap on my hand and put it in his hair and he looked at me like I had pinched him and I said, I love you. And then I said, I love you again. And pretty soon he looked surprised and then his eyes softened. And then we were both scrubbing the dirt out from between his little toes together, talking about how much we love each other. And he was laughing and playing in the water and actually didn't want to get out of the shower at the end because I mean, showers really feel very nice. And he told me he loved me too. Now, I am in no way God. And as strong as my own love is for my child, it is a reflection upon this love that stuns me into an awe 
when I realize that God's love for each one of us is stronger still. God is a God who loves us, even when God is pointing out to each one of us our need for a hot bath, using a stern voice to remind us that it is God's turn to override our own urge to run. And while there is a lot going on in the four chapters of this book of Scripture, I think at the heart of the story of Jonah is the story of God, who is saying to Jonah and Nineveh and to us today, hey, I love you. I love you. I love you. And God says it over and over and over again until all of God's people have hearts that are softened and spirits that are humble and even brave enough to believe it. So my invitation to all of you is this. I invite you to sit today and reflect upon the definition of grace that we receive from the story of Jonah this morning. That definition is this. Grace is the assurance that God simply will not give up on God's people. Grace is the assurance that God simply will not give up on us. Any discussion or, on theology or the cost of grace or what we must do as a people of faith to respond to this grace only takes root when we stop and hear the truth of God's love for us. For God loves us in a way that is gracious and unconditional and God's grace is the assurance that God simply will not give up on us. Whether we are mired in the collective sin of our culture's systems, or whether we are shouting curses at our neighbor, God rescues us from our deepest sins as God rescues us from the bellies of whales. God even rescues us from our own selves. And God loves us still. The tricky part is remembering this is true. And it's true not only for us and those we see when we look in the mirror, or even those we see when we look around us in the pews. This is true when we read stories in our newspaper, when people take our spot, in the parking lot at Giant Eagle, when we have been hurt, when those we love have been hurt too. But God is a God who simply does not give up on God's people. Sit first with this promise Hear this truth. See how it feels in your heart and your mind. How it challenges you and the way you act and the way you perceive the world. The way you look at yourself. Sit in the fact that God calls us not only to have hope in God, but that God has hope in us. God is a God who will not give up on us. God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God simply will not give up. Thanks be to God. Amen.